And, you know, from my perspective, you know, the reason I analyze the petrodollar system so much is because it, the dollar really is kind of at the crux of global macro. Uh, so even in my investing decisions outside of Bitcoin, you're really understanding the dollar's detail, right? Whether it's you're going to get inflation or deflation, commodity boom, commodity bust, emerging market boom, emerging market bust, whether or not U.S. growth is going to be fast or slow, a lot of it's based on the dollar. And so basically because we structured things uh, ever since the 70s around this petrodollar system, uh, it's basically exported a lot of supply chains, especially from the United States, uh, to these other emerging markets uh, led by led by China, but also others. Yeah, one of the most interesting things Alex talked about, that this is just completely off topic, but I just found it fascinating, that um, he talked about the second Gulf War. And he talked about, uh, at that time, the... Uh, Iraq Iraq government was selling their oil with the petro uh, to the for the petro euro. I think it was a petro euro, and he said one of the interesting things is that what seems to be out of the debate for a war that we know nothing about for why it happened seems to be uh, for absolutely no reasons at all that it actually might have been to defend the petro dollar, which I found fascinating. That's one of the theories, and and, and so for example, uh, you know that that got some some publicity when Ron Paul spoke in Congress about it, which is, you know, kind of the highest stage that that idea has had, where he was basically, you know, there's a, there's a big speech, I actually linked to it in one of my pieces. Um, and so, yeah, basically, you know, the, the there's not a good track record of basically these countries trying to sell oil outs, uh, outside of the dollar-based system. And so far, actually, the most successful country that's doing it now is Russia. And it's kind of like one of the, so in the past few years, they switched to, you know, selling oil uh, increasingly in euros uh, to Europe and, and, and as far as we can tell into China. Uh, and, but they're obviously big enough that the United States can't do anything militarily about it. Uh, they're, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're a major nuclear power there. And so uh, instead we have, you know, we've had these big sanction debates about the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Uh, we've had these, these, you know, other issues and it's kind of a chicken and the egg scenario. And so countries that are generally, for whatever reason, on the margins for, for political reasons, could be extremism, whatever the case may be, when they're kind of sanctioned, they increasingly turn to selling oil outside of the dollar-based system. But also if, if a country kind of sells oil outside of the dollar-based system, they tend to be these kind of relentless source of, of sanctions. Uh, and so it's just kind of, we basically have structured things in such a way that we have kind of an in or out kind of system. And if you're not in, then you're 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 pushed on the margins, and you generally struggle as a country. Do you think the the petrodollar is gradually being replaced? Do you think it will collapse? Do you think countries will continue to look at other currencies to trade oil in? There are there are signs that it's changing, and I I went over these in my article, but essentially there's a couple key things to look at. One is that when the petrodollar system began in the 70s, the United States was something like 35 percent of world GDP. And we were the biggest commodity importer, uh, and so you could you could argue that it makes more sense to price commodities in dollars. Uh, but now, over time, as that's kind of deteriorated, uh, the United States is now, depending on how you measure it, somewhere in the ballpark of 20% of global GDP. Um, and so, even though we've grown, just the rest of the world's grown faster because you had the rise of China and India and some of these other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, we're a smaller share of global GDP. We're still outsized, of course, compared to our population. We're like something like 5% of population, 20% of global GDP. Uh, we're this, but now we're the second biggest commodity importer. And so it's it's kind of a funny situation where the biggest commodity importer, China, has to go through our currency in order to, to get commodities. And so they're, they're interested in increasingly, uh, you know, uh, using their currency to, to buy commodities where possible. Uh, and then you have Russia, which is also, no, you know, no particular friend to the United States. And they've they've uh, you know kind of aggressively de-dollarized de their reserves. They went increasingly into gold and euro-based assets instead. And then they announced you know a couple years back that they were interested in selling oil in euros. And if you look at their uh, you know their trade over time uh, with Europe and with China, uh, it is de-dollarizing gradually and shifting more towards uh, euro for both of them. Uh, and then also with, with China, they're also using a little bit of local currencies as well. Uh, you know, neither dollar nor euro, but primarily they're they're replacing a big chunk of the dollar portion with euros. And so over time, you know, we're looking to see probably more uh, diverse reserves uh, among countries, and that there that there looks like there could eventually be say three currencies that can be used to buy uh, oil rather than just one. 
that that feels a lot more healthy. That that is a more it's a more decentralized system, um, and it's it's uh, even ironically for the United States. And so one of the biggest misconceptions is that the system benefits the United States, and it's one of those things where, in the first few decades, it it might have, um, mm-hmm. you know, basically Cold War era type thing, strategic positioning, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but especially since the '90s, it's really kind of accelerated to the downside, even for the United States. And so it's one of those things where there's probably the top 10% of the people in the United States benefit from it, right? Including me and direct. I mean, I, you know, I, I probably benefit from it. But anyone who in the United States works in blue collar work or you know wants to make things, essentially, they they've taken the brunt of this in the United States. And so the system's one of those. It's it's you know it's working for a few. Um, export heavy countries that are really kind of milking the system uh, and it's and it's working for US elites and it's working for basically these these kind of select uh, groups around the world but it's really not working well for most emerging markets and it's not working well for uh, you know most of the United States probably the, at least the bottom two-thirds is there anything you don't know <laughs> I feel like I throw any question at you any week and and you know everything. Well, I think you, I think you, you smartly ask things in in fields that I know. Yeah. So inflation is one of the key things I'm tracking now because it, it's setting a, a lot of the, you know what what types of assets are going to do well, what what types of assets are going to do well, uh, and what what the Fed response is going to be, uh, and that of course impacts multiple multiple aspects of markets. And so what we're seeing now is a combination of low base effects from last year. So, you know, we were comparing current numbers, CPI numbers to a dip last year. Uh, but then also on top of that base effect, uh, we have very hot month over month uh, numbers. So things are coming in above expectations. Uh, and that's, there's a, there's kind of two main reasons for that. One is, uh, you know, the things I've been tracking for a while is the increase in broad money supply growth. And so ever since we saw the big money supply growth in, in 2020, uh, which was different than anything that happened in 2008, 2009. Uh, so it's not just QE; it's it's QE that combined with fiscal spending that gets that money out into into people's bank accounts. Um, uh, when you have the broad money supply go up, that's monetary inflation, and it tends to uh, uh, cause price inflation. But of course, the the degree to that depends on all sorts of things related to productivity and other deflationary forces. Uh, and so, you know, once we started to open up, my my base case was that that big increase in broad money supply is going to be price inflationary. Uh, now, the second thing you need is some sort of either productivity limit or scarcity. Uh, and so, for example, if you look back at the previous two inflationary decades, the 70s and the 40s, the 70s had the oil embargo, right? So you had oil shortages. And then the 40s had all sorts of commodity shortages related to, you know, you're trying to fight the war and you want every, you know, we even changed what we make our pennies out of because we needed to save the metal. Uh, and so, you know, both those decades, you know, basically you had, you had the combination of big money supply growth and some sort of scarcity somewhere. And so what we're seeing in 2020 and 2021 uh, is that we saw this big increase in broad money supply. Uh, different countries did it at different paces. So the United States did it more than most other other countries, but most countries did did some kind of uh, big M2 broad money supply increase. And then you're getting uh, you know fragilities in the global supply chain. So semiconductors are 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 in short supply, uh, and so that's that's trickling into things like used cars, right? Because it's, it's impacting how much new cars can be made. And therefore, you know, uh, people are going into the the used car market to pull, you know, increase the prices enough to convince people to sell. Uh, and so, then uh, you're seeing food price inflation. You're seeing broad commodity uh, inflation. Uh, and so, overall, we're, we're seeing pretty hot numbers come in. And I I think that the you know we saw the the April numbers reported in mid May, and you know next month we're going to get the May numbers reported in mid June. I think those are going to be even higher year over year. Uh, but then after you you go past that. I think the rate of change could stabilize to some extent, where it's, it's no longer going up at the at the rate it has been. Uh, but a key thing I keep pointing out is is the difference between transitory inflation in absolute terms and transitory inflation in rate of change terms. And so, for example, if you look at the 40s, you had these three big spikes of inflation, uh, and so inflation would, would go from like zero to like 18 percent, and then it would go back down to like one percent, and then it would you know go to two percent, and then it would go back up to like you know, 12% and they go back down. But there was never really a period of deflation after the inflation. So it's not like prices went up and then came back down. Instead, they went up, they got to a new higher plateau, and then they stabilized. And then they went up again, then they stayed there and stabilized, and they went up again, and then they eventually stabilized for a longer period of time. And so what you have is kind of a permanent stepwise increase in prices. And so I think that's kind of, you know, 
the media is kind of mixing up what transitory means. That you know, transitory means it's different than prices coming back down. It's prices going up and then just kind of that's the new price. Yeah, that's the new price. And so, mm. but of course, you'll have some things like you know, there there are key things that are really bottlenecked, like like lumber, for example, due to the sawmill constraint. So so timber is available; it's pretty cheap. Uh, but there's a, there's only so many sawmills, and so converting that timber into lumber has a bottleneck, and so you have this kind of parabolic price action. So I think some things like lumber are going to you know give back some of those gains. So they are, they already have to some extent, um, and so whether or not this was the peak, I don't really have a strong opinion. But basically, you know, I, there are certain kind of key things that got too expensive that will come back. But in a broad sense, uh, you know, a lot of these price increases, even when the dust settles, will be at a higher level. Uh, than, than where they started. And then from there, it'll largely depend on what happens next with fiscal policy. Uh, you know, So if they don't do another big burst of fiscal, uh, you could get inflation leveling off again. Uh, whereas if they do another big burst of fiscal, that's when you're, you're probably going to see another round of price increases. Okay. So the last thing is uh, Biden's $6 trillion figure, which is a number I can't even get my head around. Um, what's your re- what was your reaction to that? Um, my, my first reaction to all these things is is questioning what parts of it are going to get through Congress. And so, for example, the okay. president's the president's proposal usually does not get through Congress in the original form. Uh, and, and as we've seen, for example, Biden's been working on this um, stimulus package separately, this uh, fiscal, the infrastructure bill, right? So, uh, you know, that, you know, kind of the first proposal was like $3 trillion, and the Republicans were like, how about half trillion? And then they're like, okay, how about two and a half trillion? And like, okay, how about one trillion? Uh, and and defining what is what is infrastructure, right? So, uh, kind of that 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 debate's working its way through Congress, and it's one of those things where in the current environment, because the Senate is so closely divided, uh, you know, Biden can get something through with a budget reconciliation, meaning that only 50 votes are needed, but there are a handful of centrist Democrats that you know are are kind of you know on the border between Democrat and Republican, and that aren't on board with like you know the the really big numbers. Um, and so, you know, in order to get through that, he needs to kind of tone it down. And and then, of course, the midterms come in. And so, you know, overall, what we're seeing is is kind of a dance between what the administration wants versus what they can get through the Senate. They can get most things through the House at this point, at least until the midterms. But getting things through the Senate is is kind of their current bottleneck. And so overall, what I'm weighing is is less so the headlines. I kind of fade the headlines a little bit, but they're they're directionally important to show where the administration's headed, uh, and then we'll see what happens with the midterms. Because if the you know the midterms, if you get a red sweep, uh, then it, it it probably reduces uh, what you're going to get. Whereas if if they strengthen the the blue Senate majority, then some of these bigger packages have a chance to go through. Uh, and so that's kind of what I'm watching now is is more about kind of watching actual dealmanship in the Senate versus how that might affect the inflation versus deflation outlook compared to just these headline numbers. 